The bigger issue, though, and the one that we'll spend some more time on as we continue to be in this kind of tragic vein for a little while in our class together, is this idea of catharsis. So catharsis, as you'll hopefully recall, is a purging of emotional tensions. It's a, uh, a moment in... Uh, it could be, you know, a time that a joke that wasn't really that funny just struck you as funny and you laughed way harder than you should. And at the end, you were like, man, I just needed that. Uh, it's a painful massage that at the end, uh, because it's painful, rings out some of the kinks or some of the soreness in your back. Uh, it should, for Aristotle, if it's a good tragedy and, and the audience is sensitive to what's happening in the story, uh, a good tragedy should purge us of pity and fear, kind of ring out these bottled up emotions that we hold on to. And we should feel kind of weirdly refreshed, uh, not like, uh, you know, waking up from a nap, but more like uh, the feeling of like a, a, a good exercise. And at the end of it, we've gone through something difficult uh, and we just feel kind of, we feel a sense of relief or a sense of cleansing. So pity here for Aristotle is genuine empathy, uh, usually connected to an idea that the character is not receiving what he should be receiving. Maybe he deserves to be punished, but in this case, he's being punished far more than he deserves. Fear then also is uh, some way in which maybe we could relate to this. So for uh, Macbeth, for instance, it's very unlikely that we're ever going to be in a situation where you need to assassinate a political leader in order to live out some uh, fate that's been handed to you by spectral beings in the woods. But it is maybe possible that uh, ambition or a desire for power uh, could lead us down a road that we didn't think we'd be on or that we would get to the end of our life and look back on decisions that we've made and feel that we made the wrong decisions, even though we thought they were the right ones at the time. Those kinds of things uh, I think we could think about when we look at a conquo. Um, and we talked about this a little bit. Uh, I'll hang on this slide for a second if you want to at least look at the page numbers, which you might want to use when you write your paper. Okay. Uh, so a couple things about this final tragedy. I would argue that a conquest tragedy is kind of a microcosm for the larger tragedy of Umuofia. When a conquo dies, uh, his death symbolizes the end of that kind of traditional culture. Uh, and, and his death is the death of Umuofia uh, in this, this sense of that center, uh, that proverbial uh, source of values or virtues when it shifts. Uh, it's gone. And, and Akankwo, uh, when he dies, kind of symbolizes the end of that prevailing mode of thinking. So thinking about catharsis here, I think uh, you can read through these examples. There's a couple different ways that we can access pity and fear for Akankwo. We can see uh, a man who has striven to try to make uh, something of himself in a society that he is certainly a product of, like he's a function of that communal environment. He only has those values because uh, he grew up in that society. Uh, and yet he acted on them with the expectation that society would validate them only to find that he would be rewarded for his hard work with greater suffering. I think also one of the, the scariest things, honestly, and, and uh, this might just be me, but one of the scariest things for Akanko is that he is blinded to the weaknesses that make himself susceptible to failure. Like he, does not ever come to a self-awareness about how he complicates his own life. You could think back to part two when he beats his son, Nawawi for hanging out with the Christians at the, at the Christian church. Uh, and Nawawi leaves, never to return. And Akankwo spends all this time thinking about why have I been cursed with such a son? Uh, you know, I am burning fire, giving birth to impotent ash. But he never stops to think, have I treated my son fairly? Maybe I shouldn't have beaten him up, choked him, right? All these horrible things that Akankwo does as a father. But he never asks himself those questions. Uh, and he's alarmingly forced to view himself by the end of this book. And that is terrifying. It's terrifying to think that you can think yourself in the right for your whole life and then come to the end of it and be forced to handle something that you've been ignoring your entire life and you're just not able to handle it. And that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a, a horrible idea uh, that uh, Akankwo's tragic story kind of highlights for us. So what do we do with all this? What's Achebe trying to do here? Why does he present this character for us? Uh, I think it's important to recognize that Achebe doesn't 
really show his hand too much in terms of like how he wants us to think about these things, how he wants us to view a conquo. Uh, there's a, there's a kind of uh, neutral objectivity to his narrative perspective um, in which he just kind of presents this stuff to us. So he put, he puts cruelty and beauty side by side, injustice and progress side by side for an example, uh, which I think we've referenced before. He talks about this, you know, Umofian superstition about not calling a snake a snake at night. And he just puts that in like the same chapter as he describes this this horrible practice of abandoning twins in the forest to die. And and Achebe just kind of tells us them in the same kind of way, the same kind of objective narrative perspective. Similarly with the British imperialism, he talks about schools and hospitals, but he also clearly tells us a story about uh, how because one British man was killed while riding a bicycle. An entire town is completely destroyed by the British. A whole scale like genocide uh, alongside schools and hospitals. Um, and, and that can be a frustrating thing for us, uh, but it's part of Achebe's, I think, larger goal to describe this like negative uh, notion in Europe. And we looked at this last module in our imperialism section. This desire, one might say a need, uh, to set Africa up as a foil to Europe, as a place of negations at once remote and vaguely familiar, in comparison with which Europe's own state of spiritual grace will be manifest. And I think what Achebe is trying to say is uh, he wants to present a complicated character. Akonkwo is not obviously a hero. He's also not obviously a villain. He's, he's a complicated guy. And you could look at his final act of suicide and say, is there a really small H level of heroism here where he knows he's going to be hung by the British anyway? Anito was. Uh, and so he decides to take matters into his own hands as a final act of, you know, his own will. Do we view this just as cowardice? You know, he tried to be everything that his father wasn't. And yet he ends up in the evil forest, just like Unica ended up in the evil forest. Do we view this as a refusal to adapt to the times, uh, a stubbornness and obstinacy, uh, is this just he's been totally destroyed by this other culture? There's a lot of ways to view it, and some of it's yes and some of it's no, and a lot of qualification is needed. And that's because Akanko is a real character, and Achebe has, has been interested in presenting over 200 pages of the lived-in experience of a man uh, whose country is being imperialized by the West.